to the first episode of Nostalgic Wrestling with the Pro Wrestling Junkie. Nostalgic Wrestling is sponsored by the Pro Wrestling Subscription Box Service, That Wrestling Club. Visit thatwrestlingclub.com to subscribe and use the promo code POPCULTUREJUNKIE to save 10% on your first box. Each episode of Nostalgic Wrestling, we will be discussing and reviewing classic wrestling shows and pay-per-view events. So whether you're a longtime fan or you just started watching, this program will give you an insight on memorable moments in the ring and behind the curtain. On this episode, we will be reviewing the 1991 WWF Royal Rumble pay-per-view. The 1991 Royal Rumble pay-per-view took place on January 19, 1991 in Miami, Florida. At this time in history, America was engaged in Operation Desert Shield, which was later changed to Operation Desert Storm, coincidentally only two days before the Rumble event. Now, the pay-per-view was headlined with the main event of current WWF champion, The Ultimate Warrior, defending the title against the now Iraqi sympathizer, Sergeant Slaughter. Now, up to this point, Sergeant Slaughter had always portrayed the real American hero. He had even been a featured character in the popular 80s cartoon, G.I. Joe. However, for storyline purposes, the WWF decided to emulate what America was going through in the Middle East and turn Slaughter heel by having him turn on America. And then they named him the number one contender for the WWF Championship. Now, the Ultimate Warrior had won the WWF title by defeating Hulk Hogan in a classic match at WrestleMania VI. And even though his ring style was not very compelling, his popularity was at an all-time high leading into the Rumble pay-per-view. Now, I know this pay-per-view took place 26 years ago, but spoiler alert, because we're about to run through the entire show and talk about the results and events that took place. First of all, if you need any reason at all to watch this show, it is Hot Rod Rowdy Roddy Piper on commentary. Okay, Piper is exploding with fire and energy. He gets the viewer hype from the very beginning, and his chemistry with Gorilla Monsoon is very memorable. And sadly, it reflects on how lacking the uh, good commentary teams are in today's uh, WWF. Match number one, the Rockers versus the Orient Express. This was a great opening match, and easily the match of the night. It's filled with lots of high flying and some great selling by the Rockers, who at this time were easily the top tag team in the WWF. This match took place before at WrestleMania 6, but it's definitely an improvement. The match went about 19 minutes, and it ends with the Rockers getting the victory after Gennady rolls up Tanaka for the pinfall. After a backstage interview with Macho Man Randy Savage, we get what I consider the funniest, strangest moment in the whole pay-per-view. Sensational Sherry comes out to be interviewed by Mean Gene Okerlund. Sherry calls out the Ultimate Warrior, who does come out to the stage. Sherry begins to flirt and even kisses the Warrior in hopes that if he is successful in his title defense tonight, that he will give Savage a title match. Sherry, still pleading her case, drops to her knees where her face is practically at Warrior's crotch. And as she looks up at Warrior, we see him smirking from the kiss. He takes two fingers to wipe his lips and then repeatedly sniffs them. It's odd and unusual at its finest, okay? <laughs> the segment ends with Warrior shaking his whole body and head, looking down at Sherry. She's asking him once again, will you grant Savage a title match? And he yells, no! <laughs> Crowd goes crazy for this, but it makes me laugh every time I see it. All right, our second match of the night is the Big Boss Man versus the Barbarian with Bobby the Brain Heenan at ringside. Bobby the Brain Heenan, easily one of the best talkers and managers in the history of pro wrestling, hands down. He'd been bad-mouthing Bossman's mother, and Bossman had been battling different members of the Heenan family to get revenge. This match was all about building up Bossman to face another Heenan family member, Mr. Perfect, for the Intercontinental title at WrestleMania 7. This match had some decent action, but not a lot to write home about. Goes for about 14 minutes, Barbarian jumps off the ropes with a flying body press, but when he lands, Bossman is able to roll through it and hold him down enough for the pinfall. Okay, match number three, we got the Ultimate Warrior, WWF Champion, defending the title versus Sergeant Slaughter. Fun fact, this is the very first time the WWF Championship has ever been defended at a Royal Rumble pay review. Before the match, we see backstage promos from both competitors. We see Sergeant Slaughter standing there with the world's biggest chin as General Adnan is praising him. My favorite moment is whenever Slaughter begins to talk, his first words looking at the camera and he goes, Ultimate Puke! <laughs> <laughs> then we get a promo from the Warrior, and it is your typical classic Warrior promo with lots of grunting and snorting. <laughs> Time for the title match. Slaughter's out first with Adnan. Warrior's music hits, and he runs to the ring quickly, attacking both Slaughter and Adnan. Knocks them both out, grabs the Iraqi flag, rips it in half. Warrior should easily squash Slaughter, and he does have complete control of the match until suddenly Sensational Sherry shows up at ringside, who is still upset at Warrior for turning down her request from earlier. Warrior chases Sherry out of the ring to the backstage area 
as he's coming up on the curtain, all of a sudden, Macho Man Ray Savage blindsides Warrior. He strikes him with a spotlight, and by now, Slaughter has regained his senses in the ring, and he's distracting the referee and preventing a count out. Now, my feelings on this, Warrior takes way too much damage from Savage, and therefore takes way too long to get back into the ring. It should have been a count out, or this should have taken place right by the ring, where Slaughter should have been able to just grab him, throw him back in the ring, and pin him right there, one, two, three. The match should have been already over. But Warrior makes him back in, and Slaughter takes control by attacking Warrior's back. He uses a bear hug. He finally applies the camel clutch, but the whole time, Warrior's legs are sticking out from under the bottom rope the entire time, even though the ref doesn't bother to look. Warrior does begin to mount a comeback, and just when he hits Slaughter with a flying shoulder block, Sherry reappears. Warrior pulls her into the ring. Gorilla Press slams her over the top rope onto Savage. Slaughter then drives a knee into the back of Warrior and chokes him over the middle rope, which distracts the referee again. This is when Savage smashes his scepter over Warrior's head and then runs off with Sherry. Slaughter pins Warrior, and we got a new WWF champion. This match was crazy busy and did give Warrior a good way out of losing the title without getting too much damage. It went about 12 minutes, but it, I feel like it could have easily been 6 minutes and still had the same effect. In match number 4, we had the Mountie versus Coco Beware. Okay, this was a typical enhancement squash match to make the Mountie look strong. Goes for about 9 minutes, could have been a little shorter. Mountie gets the pinfall victory. as a good come down match after the craziness from the previous title match. All right, match number five. We got Million Dollar Man, Teddy Biasi, and his bodyguard, Virgil, versus the Rhodes family of Dusty and Dustin Rhodes. In case you're wondering who Dustin Rhodes is, he's currently Gold Dust in the WWE. So, DiBiase and Dusty Rhodes have been feuding for months, and this was to be the blow off match. At the same time, Virgil has become disgruntled with how DiBiase has been treating him and disrespecting him. During the match, Dustin Rhodes ducks a clothesline attempt by Virgil and ends up clotheslining DiBiase. DiBiase gets upset, attacks Virgil before tossing him out of the ring. Now Dustin gets a hot tag to his father who strikes DiBiase, goes for a splash in the corner only to have DiBiase sidestep and then roll up Dusty for the pinfall. I really feel like the Rhodes family should have had the victory here. As soon as DiBiase attacked Virgil, I think they should have gotten the pinfall on DiBiase. Would have added a lot more heat to DiBiase being upset at Virgil. After the match, DiBiase grabs a mic, instructs Virgil to bring his million dollar belt into the ring and put it around his waist. As the crowd is chanting for Virgil to not do it, Virgil does comply. But once he's in the ring, he blindsides DiBiase by striking him with the belt, tosses the belt onto DiBiase, and walks out of the ring with his head held high, and the crowd's cheering him for standing up for himself finally. Then we go backstage, and after several pre recorded promos by some of the participants, we go to the actual Rumble match itself. Of course, this is a 30 man match where it's every man for himself. The only way to win is by eliminating everyone by throwing them over the top rope to the floor. And the last man in the ring is the winner. Now today when a superstar wins the Royal Rumble, they get a title match at WrestleMania. But during this time, it was just about the prestige of winning the Rumble match. Sadly, this Rumble match is nothing spectacular. There are numerous future legends and Hall of Famers like Earthquake, Dino Bravo, Mr. Perfect, Jake the Snake Roberts, Brett the Hitman Hart, so many to name. But really, no big moments happen in this match. Interesting fact, this is the very first Royal Rumble that The Undertaker participated in. The final three of the match were Earthquake, Brian Knobs, and Hulk Hogan. Not surprisingly, of course, Hulk Hogan, whom earlier in the night had dedicated the match to the men and women of our military, overcame the odds, overcame the 2-on-1 attack, and eliminated both Knobs and Earthquake to win the Rumble. The show ends with Hogan standing proud in the ring, waving the American flag. The Rumble went about an hour and five minutes. Interesting facts about the Rumble, Hogan won the Rumble with only seven eliminations, which was actually the most by a single superstar that night. By winning the Rumble, Hulk Hogan became the first superstar ever to win the Rumble match twice and in consecutive years, something that would not happen again until Stone Cold Steve Austin won the 1997 and 98 Rumbles. The wrestler with the longest time was Rick Martel, who entered at number 6 and stayed in for 52 minutes and 17 seconds. That was incredible. And the wrestler with the shortest time was Bushwhacker Luke, who entered at number 27 and lasted a total of 4 seconds. <laughs> this Rumble only had 29 participants as well because Macho Man Randy Savage did not show up for his appearance due to being chased out of the building by Ultimate Warrior earlier in the night. Thank you, everyone, for tuning into this episode of Nostalgic Wrestling with the Pro Wrestling Junkie. Remember, you can always see more from me by checking out my YouTube channel, Pop Culture Junkie, where I review all the topics of pop culture-related items, including pro wrestling. Remember, you can always follow along with me on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Take care. See you next time. And remember, to me, wrestling will always be real.